morning I'd like to talk about uh, a very topical subject uh, in, uh, in Sri Lankan Buddhism, in Sinhala Buddhism, which is Anicca, Anicca, usually translated as impermanence. And the theme of this talk will be Anicca, the wisdom that frees us. So that's the, the focus for the talk. And I was going to begin by mentioning, as Chinta mentioned actually, on Friday was the uh, full moon day. It was a full moon day and it marks the, the, the occasion that the Buddha gave his first teaching. This is the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta. We, we translate that into English as uh, setting in motion the wheel of Dhamma uh, that, uh, so that Dhamma was born into the world. The Buddha became enlightened. Of course, at Bodh, uh, Bodh Gaya or Buddha Gaya, as the, uh, they call it in Sri Lanka. But it wasn't really until he taught it that we had Dhamma in the world. Not only did we have Dhamma, because of course that first teaching that he gave at Sarnath, not far from what's now modern Varanasi, um, was the first teaching to the five former companions that had abandoned him. When he started taking food, they thought he was getting luxurious. <laughs> He was eating milk rice. <laughs> and so they had abandoned him. So he gave this teaching to them. So this was the Dhamma, the first time the Dhamma had been taught in the world since the previous Buddha. There's always been many, many Buddhas in the past. And, and at that, on that occasion, the Sangha came into being too. The Sangha is the uh, community of monks and nuns. These are, are people who dedicate their lives to the spiritual life, to practicing the Buddha's teaching, realizing the Buddha's teaching. So this is a very important day, the, the full moon of July, for that reason. And for me, and I was encouraging people yesterday at the day retreat, when we do our meditation, just to think what a treasure we have. You know, the Dhamma, the Buddha did teach the Dhamma. You know, he was tempted not to, because he'd finished the work. You know, he was completely at ease with the world. He had finished with, as we say, samsara. So he had nothing. He had no discomfort, I mean he had the bodily discomfort, but no mental discomfort whatsoever. So he could have easily not taught. And of course we have the story that the Brahma Sahampati invited him to teach and that was the occasion for him teaching. Um, so this is something that we can get a lot of happiness and, uh, from, we can get a lot of joy and also gratitude, thanks to the Buddha that he, he did teach. Because I sometimes think, you might think too, what would the world be like without the Buddha's teaching? And I think we'd be fumbling in the dark, we'd come up with all sorts of explanations for why we were experiencing this and that. Some of them we, we already hear these days, you know, here's some very bizarre uh, understandings of what reality is about. But when we hear what the Buddha, how the Buddha describes reality, we think, wow, that's very reasonable, that's common sense, I can relate to that. I don't have to believe in anything. I can just see it from my own experience to a large extent. So we should have a, a for, for Buddhists or for those that are interested in Buddhism, it can be a lot of joy. And when we do our meditation, we can just have this joy. Ah, you know, the Buddha taught the Dhamma, and what a precious thing it is. Because as Buddhists, we can get so used to the Dhamma being there that we forget that it's actually a rare thing in the world. And it will disappear and in time, and then another Buddha will arise. And of course, uh, yesterday was a very important day for us too because the day after the full moon, we, the monks and the nuns, we enter what we call the rains retreat, the vasa or vas as they call it in Sri Lanka. And this is a, uh, an important time for the community because it's a time when uh, monks and nuns can focus on the meditation for sure. But in the time of the Buddha, it was also very much a time that uh, the, the lay community could have access to the monks and nuns because they were staying in one place for three months. At the time of the Buddha, and especially in the early days of the Buddha's teaching, they were wandering a lot. So they're going from place to place, the Buddha was too. And they weren't staying in one place very often or very much or for a very long time. So the range retreat was a very good opportunity to get uh, teachings and consistent teachings, you know, uh, uh, gradual teachings that develop. And so this was uh, also a time for the community to, um, the lay community, to develop their practice, their understanding, go deeper. And uh, the very important thing about the invitation really is that 
it's actually, I often thought it was a bit odd. In, in the Thai tradition, we don't have it, actually, the invitation for the, the wasa. It's interesting, because the monks often have been living in that monastery years, <laughs> years and years. But the reason for this invitation, which I like very much, actually, is that it's an invitation for the monastics to stay in that monastery, this uh, vihara. But it's also an offer of support for that period. That is very important, you know, especially in the time of the Buddha. You know, you needed to know that there would be enough food, enough requisites for the three-month period. So that is one of the one of the big um, uh, one of the aspects of that invitation, which is very important as, as well. And uh, yesterday, Chinta mentioned that the teaching. So that's very good. So. I was going to talk about Anicca, and I'm sure most people know, have heard of Anicca, and uh, we often call it uh, one of the three characteristics of existence. It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> three characteristics of existence. Tilakana is what they call it. And uh, a Buddhist explanation of how it's, it's how, what reality is like, what reality is about. So this is um, something we can actually see in our own experience, that the reality that we experience, things are, well, one of the uh, words we can use for, uh, for uh, uh, a nature is impermanence. That things, are, or we can use transitory, unsatisfactory, uh, sorry, transitoriness, uh, uncertainty, many words. I'll talk about them in a minute. But we can see this is a, uh, in our own experience, that life is moving on, whether we like it or not, it's moving on. The good times, it still moves on. The bad times, it still moves on, which is good news. And we can see in our own experience, and this is the second uh, characteristic, isn't it, dukkha, that life is not, uh, there is, is unsatisfactory. You know, we can never get complete satisfaction from anything in our lives. You know, things that we like, yes, we like them, but they can't completely satisfy us. And often, you know, we may have an experience we like, sense pleasure that we like, nice food, nice meals, always impermanent, but very hard to repeat to get the same experience. And the nature of our senses, they take us very naturally towards addiction because we want that particular feeling that we get from that particular sense pleasure, be it food, uh, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. And we're trying to get that peak experience and often we don't get back to it. It doesn't, we can't repeat it. So this is the aspect of unsatisfactoriness. And I think everybody can relate to that. If I say suffering, some people say, well, I'm not suffering. Because in English, suffering is a pretty extreme word. Uh, but uh, dukkha actually covers all aspects of uh, unsatisfactoriness. And the Buddha, uh, the Buddha described as old age sickness, death, not getting what you want, being associated with things and people you don't like and being separated from those that you do like. Um, so these are, these are aspects of dukkha. And we can see this in our life. The third aspect of, uh, of uh, existence, of course, is anatta, or in similar, anatma. And that's non-self. This is more difficult for us to see because we have very, very deep conditioning to see everything in terms of me and the other person, me and them. <laughs> you know, so. This is a very deep one that we can't necessarily see, but uh, sometimes people do hit upon it and they, they see this quality of non-self. But they all come together in the sense that the Buddha says whatever is transient, whatever is uncertain, whatever is impermanent, what we can't rely on, that will cause dukkha. That is the cause, the basic reason things are unsatisfactory is because of, of uh, anicca, because they're impermanent. It won't last. My favourite, actually, my tr favourite translation of Anicca is nothing lasts, because that has a, a really emotional impact. And people say, well, impermanence is a bit sort of, you can't emotionally, um, uh, you don't have a strong feeling when you hear a word like that, because it's very abstract. So whatever, whatever is Anicca, whatever is impermanent, transient, changeable, will cause dukkha. That's the essence. That's where our dukkha, our suffering, our unsatisfactory, uh, experience of unsatisfactoriness is coming from. The fact that it's all moving. We can't hang on. And then the Buddha says, whatever is a Nietzsche, uh, uh, whatever is dukkha, is that worthy and changing? 
what, is that worthy to call a self? Because if it's changing all the time, where do you hang self? Where do you hang self? Am I the self that I was when I was three years old? Or I'm the self when I was 12, when I was 25, 30, 60, you know, all this. You see, we're changing all the time. So this self, there's no place to hang it, actually. But it's not to say, sometimes people think, you know, it's sort of like we're all blank um, um, zombies or something. But we all have our personalities. We all have our conditioning. And this is the reason, this is the Buddha's explanation of why there is and isn't a self. There isn't something that's lasting, permanent. Uh, is because it's all conditioned. It arises it's there for a time, and then it will pass away. So it's the, the basic nature of existence. I like, a, there's an Ajahn Chah story I like. It's in the uh, collected teachings of Ajahn Chah, but it's a rather nice one. He, I think it was when he was a layman this, this comes from, actually, because I, I can't imagine him doing this as a monk, but he was visiting ancient ruins, uh, ancient uh, ruined monasteries in Thailand, you know, mainly perhaps from the Khmer period, you know, in, in Cambodia as well. And uh, he and his friends would see that these beautiful uh, monasteries, beautiful buildings had big cracks in them and, you know, it was, um, they could see that they were broken down. And, they th and one of his, uh, he'd say, this is what he said, maybe one of my friends would remark, ah, such, such a shame, isn't it? It's cracked. <laughs> I'd answer, even though I, f I also felt that it was a pity that it was cracked, still I tended towards the Dhamma and he said, this is what he said to his friends, he said, if it wasn't cracked like that, there wouldn't, wouldn't be any Buddha. <laughs> exactly right, because if there wasn't cracked like that, there wouldn't be any impermanence, there wouldn't be any transient, there wouldn't be any dukkha. <laughs> so, and then he, he goes on to say, I'd say it really heavy for the benefit of my friends, Perhaps they weren't listening, that's quite interesting, but still I was listening. <laughs> so that's, he was teaching himself at that time. But I think he must have been a lay person at that time, because it, it seems, I think I can't imagine him visiting ruins as a monk, actually. So then, uh, you know, this also begs the question of the meaning of a Nietzsche. I don't want to make this a dry lecture or anything, but uh, it's quite important because as these days there is some controversy over the meaning of a Nietzsche and there's some new interpretations that uh, I think people are confused about. But the important thing to remember is that a Nietzsche is not really a word, it's an experience, an insight. And it's what the Buddha is pointing towards is direct uh, knowledge, direct experience, abhinya they called it. And this is what a what uh, a Nietzsche really is. The meaning of it, the words we use, will only ever be approximately right. They won't, they won't be able to capture it all. It's not as if, you know, when a person you know, has this, uh, has an uh, inside experience into a Nietzsche, into impermanence, that they'll start using words like impermanence. You know, they'll think, ah, impermanent. They'll be experiencing this for themselves as a real experience, not as a label. So we shouldn't get too uh, too concerned with the words, as long as they capture something of the, uh, the essence. Because when you, when I, when any, all of us, when we experience that breakthrough into insight about Anicca, we'll know for ourselves. We won't have to use the, you won't have to rely on definitions and all this sort of thing. So that's the important thing. And as I said, very common uh, word is impermanence, and I think everybody uh, is probably used to that. You know, impermanence is very, a very common translation of a Nietzsche. And I think it's quite a good one, actually, not too bad. Uh, as I said, I prefer nothing lasts because that's got more of an impact. And when I hear, you know, when you hear that the Buddha taught to the Davis, to the Brahmas about impermanence and Nietzsche, and it caused absolute terror for them. They were so frightened when they heard it. And you can imagine, if you have that meaning of nothing lasts, and they're thinking that their lives are eternal, they will stay like this, this is heaven, they, won't, they will never fall from this. And then they hear from this very wise person, this very powerful person, no, you're impermanent, you, you will, nothing lasts, you'll fall away from this existence. It created terror for them, they thought, wow. So, and uh, other words that I like are transience is good too. Transience is good.
because it's the essence of samsara. We call this is the round of rebirth, being born, uh, dying and being born again and again. This going on and on and on. And uh, um, samsara is likened to, you know, a journey we're on, samsaric journey people often talk about. And it's like we're moving all the time. We can't stop. And uh, I like transients cause we, because uh, we also have uh, the idea of the transit lounge. <laughs> In airports, we have transit lounges. And I say, we're all in the transit lounge, but some, most people don't realize it. <laughs> Where are we transiting? We're transiting to the next life. We're transiting towards death and the next life. Unless, you know, we, we uh, become enlightened and we can finish this whole repetition over and over again. We can break that cycle. Another translation, which is very, uh, I think, very useful, and uh, Ajahn Chah described it as very uh, practical, very useful for our practice. And that is uncertainty, uncertainty. Certain, uh, it is for sure, anything that's uncertain will cause us some suffering, dukkha. It will cause us some disease, discomfort. And a lot of our insecurities, our fears, they arise from this uncertainty. When we're uncertain about somebody, you see this in romantic relationships, when, when the person's uncertain of the other person's uh, um, affection, then that really causes them turmoil. They get very, but it's all types of uncertainty. And where this comes from is uh, from um, Ajahn Brahm uses it as well as Ajahn Shah. Where it comes from is from the Vinaya, where the Buddha talks about in the Vinaya a regular meal is like a weekly meal or a monthly meal or even an annual meal. And it's called a nitya, nitya, a dana. We have that word dana. And um, so this is a regular meal. So it gives us an idea of what anitya means, anitya, which means not regular, not constant. And so we get the idea of not certain. Um, and also other translations are like not fixed. Nothing is fixed. You can't, you can't, nothing is stable, it's unstable. It's not, you can't rely on it. And there's a very nice um, Ajahn Chah story I like. Oh, well, it's more like a teaching, really. He would, oh, this is good, good timing. He'd hold up a cup and say, say to people, it's already broken. <laughs> they think, wow, well, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's not, not, not broken yet. And uh, no, he said, yes, it's already broken because one day it will break. Because it's come into existence, it has to break. And he said, you know, one day, you know, your dog may kick it over, your child may kick it over. And he said, you will hate them if we're breaking your cup because we're very attached to our things, our possessions and whatnot, our bodies. <laughs> um, so he said, if we see this as, as something that is liable to break, will break, actually, it's not liable to break. You know, uh, I once heard the Dalai Lama say something like, when you may die, I thought, that's not, that's not, it's not optional. <laughs> it's not optional, actually. <laughs> I thought, will die is probably more accurate, but it's being, I think, quite kind to the audience. But when we know that the cup is already broken, Ajahn Shah said, we have a spillway. Now what's a spillway? When a dam, you know in a dam you have a spillway where the water, when the level builds up, it can overflow. If it doesn't overflow, if you don't have a spillway, it'll go over the dam and probably destroy the dam actually. So the spillway saves the dam. And in the same way, when we understand the nature of existence, of this cup, of our bodies, of everything, our possessions, all our family, our children, Every, everything in this world. We understand that. We have the spillway that, yes, it's come into existence. Yeah, it will break. It is already broken in the sense that it's got those factors for it to break up already in there. You know, the Im impermanence, transience, uncertainty is already in there. So that's quite a, I, I quite like that because very practical and the idea of a spillway is very nice because in times of stress we do need some sort of overflow to allow it to flow away so the pressure doesn't build up because if we're all, if we're in, uh, we're in conflict with reality, we want it to be other than it can, than it is. We want it to be permanent. We don't want, 
You know, those, those people and things that are dear to us, we don't want them to pass away, break out, die, or be separated from them. But when we have this understanding, when we're in tune with reality, then we can let go. This is the whole point of it, isn't it? It's the whole point of a Nietzsche. This is the, as I called it, the wisdom that frees us, is to let a, allow us to let go. Because we're attached to all these things. And when we're attached to things that are moving, that are changing, it's going to bring a lot of uh, suffering and difficulty if we really attach, hold hard. And I liken this to, if you hold on to a moving car, it's just going to drag you, <laughs> either fast or slow, until you realize, it's moving, let go, and then you're okay. But we are, we're all trying to hang on to the moving car, you know, be it our, our family, our friends, our children, our bodies, you know, whatever it is, our attainments, all these things, you know, are going to, uh, are impermanent. They will, will pass away. They will, um, we will be parted from them. So fortunately it's still not broken, but... <laughs> can still use it. But uh, the wisdom of that too is uh, very important to emphasize that too. Because we know that one day this cup will break, we can take care, can't we? We'll look after it. We'll think, well, be careful because if I knock it over, it'll go on the floor and, uh, you know, break. So we can take care. And it's the same with all our relationships, with family and friends, our possessions. We can take care of them, but we know that one day they won't be there for, or we won't be there. That's another point. <laughs> we won't be there. So we understand, we have that spillway that can allow us to accept it. And a very nice story that I think most of you will know, but I still tell it nevertheless. Uh, people, I just have to say the title and people will know, good, bad, who knows? Do you know that story? Ajahn Brahm tells it in uh, his, well, the book's called Good, Bad, Who Knows, actually. Um, and that's the story of a Chinese farmer. It's an, an old story. This one from the Mahayana tradition. There is a Theravada one, too, which is more complicated, actually. But very, same idea. And once there was this farmer in China, and uh, he had a family, and he had one horse. And that horse was very, very useful for him. He used it for... Uh, you know, getting to the village, uh, taking things to market and so on. And it had a lot of use. Then one day the horse disappeared. It just vanished and couldn't find it. And the villagers said to him, Oh, that's terrible. How will you get to the village, get to the town, take your things to market? And he said, Good, bad, who knows? And then, not much later, the horse returned. Not alone, but with a whole group of other wild horses. And so the villagers said, oh, wonderful, now you're you know, really rich. <laughs> You've got lots of horses. And the farmer said, good, bad, who knows? And then the next thing was his son was looking after the horses and he was training, he was breaking them in because they're wild horses, actually. And one of these wild horses threw him off its back and he broke his leg very badly so that he was more or less permanently an invalid or, you know, a crippled. He could walk, but he um, it was very. It wasn't very easy. And all the villagers said to him, "That's terrible. Your son, you know, this to happen to him. He's only young, and you know, how is he going to manage?" And the farmer said, "Good, bad. Who knows?" And then, of course, not much later, the king was at war with a neighbouring kingdom. So he was recruiting all the able young men. Came to the village and took all the young men, but not the farmer's son. <laughs> And the farmer said, good, bad, who knows? <laughs> so that's the wisdom of Anicca. When Keeping that sort of open mind about our experience, that all things are uncertain. And you know, to me, and I think we all have this experience, some of the worst things we can imagine happening in our lives do happen. And actually, they turn out to be, have a very positive benefit in, in, in the long term after we've got over the original shock. You know, maybe someone's passed away. I remember when my father passed away, it was a real shock. He had a heart attack and uh, he was there one day and gone. But it was really for me, you know, I grew so much after that. And that's what they say, actually, when your parents die, you really grow up. 
It's true, it's true. And many things like that. Some of the worst things people can imagine, like splitting up from their partner and so on. At the time, it'll be great suffering, incredible uh, um, uh, turmoil in their lives. But later on, they may say, thank you, thank you. I wouldn't have had this happen. And a good example, of course, is one of the famous examples, in a way, is uh, Ajahn Chah. Because Ajahn Chah was, uh, when he was a teenager, he fell in love with one of the neighbouring girls, and he was, uh, they were both, both in love with each other, you know, intending to marry her and everything. And then one day, his friend, I've forgotten his name now, his friend said to her, I'm taking the girl, Chah, which meant this girl that Ajahn Chah was going to, what, was intending to marry. And it was actually this, his, his best friend as well. Can you imagine that? Your best friend taking... But the reason for that was that this best friend was actually the stepbrother of the girl. And the family wanted to keep the property in the family. They didn't want to have to pay a dowry. There were lots of reasons. But it really broke his heart. And actually, had he not, had that not happened, we may not have Ajahn Chah, actually. Might not. So that was, a, you know, um, a terrible experience for him. He said, actually, I think he said for about seven years, there were echoes of her in his mind. For seven years, you know, as a monk. So it was a very tough experience for him, but it turned out to be a great blessing, not only for himself, but for thousands, thousands of people. So, as I mentioned, you know, the purpose of seeing a Nietzsche, seeing that things are transient, uncertain, is for us to let go. And this is the essence of the first stage of enlightenment, isn't it? You know, this is what Anya Kandanya, this is one of the first monks uh, who heard the uh, teaching, the first teaching of the Buddha. He became the first stream winner, we call him, or Sotapanna, Sowan in Sinhala. Because, and what did he see? He saw that everything, is of, everything that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. This is, this is Anicca. This is Anicca. Everything that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. And when he saw that, he became a stream winner. Why is that? Because when we see things uh, in terms of Anicca, the mind can turn away from the attachment we have to it. And uh, one story I think of is a monk told me that uh, one time, this was just an inside experience, that he was uh, travelling in a car and he saw a um, beautiful landscaped uh, garden they were doing you know, on the side of uh, the, part, the road he was passing down. It had a beautiful pond and nice trees and the grasses all trimmed and uh, a, a little bridge, I think ornamental bridge, he said. And then before he knew it, his mind, and he liked gardens, he said he liked this, and he liked Zen gardens, and then the mind just turned. You could see that pond overgrown, full of uh, uh, dirt and the grass all gro overgrown, the trees broken, the bridge looking a bit worn and everything. And he said when he saw that, the mind just went Phew. And you might think, well, that would be terrible, wouldn't it be depressing? but it's great happiness, he <laughs> said. It's great joy because what happens is the mind is free from these attachments. We think these attachments, these likes and dislikes are our great joy. You know, they're the purpose in life, they give us happiness, but they're also the prison that we live in. And when the mind is free from that prison, when it turns away from it, it does this by itself, I should say. It's not, it's not something that one wills. It does it by itself, then there's great joy and then it's liberated, it's free of that attachment. So this is, this is one thing I should emphasize, that the understanding of Anicca, the experience of the inside of Anicca, is one of great happiness, not suffering at all, because you started to realize what reality is about, what it's like. And the reason that um, uh, I, I'm giving this talk, I gave this talk in Colombo, actually, last week, <laughs> Gave it last week. Uh, last week? Yes, the week before. And uh, is that uh, in recent times there have been some uh, teachers, uh, monks in particular, who have been teaching that Anicca is not a Nietzsche. It's not uh, impermanence or transience, uncertainty, um, uh, all these sorts of words. They're saying it's Anicca. I don't know if you can hear that. 
anicca. In Pali, it means not wished for. Icca is like wish or want, not desired. And so they're teaching this interpretation because they say that leads to dukkha. And of course it does. I will actually say this, that is part of the Buddha's teaching. The core, one of the causes of dukkha, the first noble truth we call it, is that if you don't get what you want, if you are associated with what you don't like, it will lead to suffering, it will lead to unhappiness in the mind, for sure. But this is not an each other. <laughs> That's what I would say anyway. But I always... I always say to people, and I emphasised it then too, you, you have to look into it and investigate it for yourself. Because the teachers, these teachers who are teaching us, are very skilled, very skilled in presenting it very well. But uh, I think it's not correct. Um, and so you have to look at the meaning of a Nietzsche and where it fits. Try it in different contexts and see if it fits. And of course the most important thing um, one of the things too that is, is very important, Ajahn Brahm always says this to us too, you cannot translate, just to use a single word as a translation, you take the context of a sentence or a phrase, it's got to be in a meaningful uh, uh, relationship with the other words. So this is very important, taking one word and then breaking it down is not a, it's not a very, uh, linguistically it's not very, uh, it doesn't give the real meaning actually. And I'm sure if I could think of it, I'd come up with some English word you could break down and you'd all laugh if you, if you thought, how can anybody say that? Well, of course, literally it's like that, but the meaning's not that. So, um, and also itcha is spelt differently as well. But I always say to us, when we have these controversies, and I say it mainly to the Sri Lankan people because this is all in Sinhala, <laughs> this controversy is all in Sinhala. And it's on YouTube, and, uh, and I hear very good monks also have made replies to it on YouTube, pointing out, you know, the sources the, of the Buddhist teaching, which are in contradiction to that understanding. But I always say to people, check up. Check up for yourself. Go to the source, the Buddha's words, wherever you can find that, whether it be in the English translations, we have very good ones you know, the Bhikkhu Bodhi translations. And also we have Sutta Central, this is a, a website, and it's got all the translations in English and in Sinhala. Unfortunately, the Sinhala is an old trans uh, tra version, it's a Soyisa translation, which is quite old, but definitely quite good. So I say that, you know, I whenever I give a talk or anything, I always say, don't believe me, check up, you know, this is always very good. I'm always suspicious, I don't know whether you are, when people say, believe me, believe me, then I worry, <laughs> I worry, I think, yeah. <laughs> so, and as I say, really with this whole controversy, you know, um, if we haven't become a sotapanna, if we haven't become a so one, we don't really know. And it's all just views and opinions, really. And I know people tell me in Sri Lanka this is very much the case. There are a lot of people who like to debate about Dhamma, they know it very well, they, they know the philosophy, they understand it, but they don't practice it. They just enjoy the debate. Because the Buddha's teaching on a philosophical level is very satisfying. It's very, um, it comes together, it's, it's a whole actually, there's, there's no contradictions. So this is what is good to, uh, to remember then, that a Nietzsche is an insight experience, it's not a word. And it gives rise to that immediate insight which will allow us to let go. This frees us, this frees the mind. And I, I think the very, and Ajahn Chah again, he said, you know, when you see the word anger written on a page, is that the same as the feeling you get when, <laughs> when you are really stirred up? No. The word anger on the page is one thing, the experience is another. It's the same with an each. So I say to everybody, myself included, that we should be humble and acknowledge that we don't really know until we've actually had that experience of anicca, and that's very important. But the Buddha, he encouraged us to develop the understanding, how to develop uh, the uh, understanding of anicca, uh, of impermanence, transience, uncertainty, whichever word you like. And we can do that through meditation, through mindfulness, and through samadhi, they're very, very useful, all those things. And uh, in particular, the, the reason for that is that our everyday minds are so busy that they don't have that much mindfulness in it. 
in, in, we don't have so much mindfulness in our everyday life. So we need good mindfulness and we need some samadhi to go look into, penetrate our experience. And that will give rise to an understanding of the Nietzsche. Um, and the Buddha encouraged us to develop, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Anicca Sanya, Anicca Sanya. This is in the Giri Mananda Sutta, which is where the Buddha is encouraging uh, us to, to look at a Nietzsche, look at this impermanence, transience in things. Um, it's, a very, uh, uh, it's very obvious to all of us that we don't. <laughs> it's the last thing we want to know about, really. We know it intellectually, but on the emotional level, the experiential level, we prefer not to know about it. The Buddha was also talk, uh, teaching about uh, uh, impermanence in the Satipatthana Sutta, when we uh, contemplate the, the uh, uh, kaya nupasana, the um, contemplation of the body or feelings or mental states or uh, dhamma, we call it dhamma, we always have to think of in terms of the arising factors and the, and the vanishing factors or both, arising and vanishing. So the Buddha is encouraging there. And of course, one of the biggest uh, uh, meditation, one of the biggest uh, contemplations is arising and passing away. And Buddha taught this too. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because the Buddha gave a, a concrete example of his own experience of being aware of things arising and passing away. As I say, we're aware of arising, beginnings. We're interested in beginnings, but Passing away? Not so much. <laughs> so, and why is that? You know, why is it? Because the Buddha was very wise. He said, what we, the way we see reality, and this is why we don't see impermanence, why we don't see a dukkha the way we, we uh, uh, the way the Buddha saw it, or see non-self, is because we're all looking for permanence, we're looking for something stable, steady, reliable, that's there, won't change, we can hang on to, hold on to. That's what we want, permanent. And also we want only happiness, we don't want dukkha. We want happiness, so this is, all our attention is going towards finding permanence, finding happiness, and non-self. Uh, we're not, not interested in non-self. We want to. We want to find proof that we, you know, we are. I am. We want to make our mark. We want people to notice that. We want to notice it. <laughs> so we. All our attention is going in the opposite direction. He also said, "What we think is beautiful, you know, because we all have ideas of what's beautiful." He says, "Is not beautiful. Not beautiful." And that is that ties in with you know that English saying, isn't it? Beauty. Isn't the eye of the beholder? And it's true, it's true. In actual fact, really intrinsically, nothing has beauty. It's just as it is, you know, whether we appreciate it or not. So that's the reason we have that, when we're not, uh, we're not training ourselves to look at things ending, seeing things cease. So, I'll just mention, because it's uh, very important, you know, to when we talk about a Nietzsche, to always refer to the Buddha, because especially when, when there is disagreements over the meanings of words, what and uh, experiences. So, what did the Buddha say about a Nietzsche? And of course, the, the main one I've already mentioned: whatever is of the nature to arise, uh, uh, is of the nature to cease. That's uh, Samudaya, and then Niroda. And he said, "This is a very nice one." And this gives the, the important thing with this, it gives the idea of time, that the Buddha is basically talking about time when we think of Anicca. He's not talking about the unwanted, the unwished. He's talking here, he says, bhikkhus, uh, bhikkhu, there, bhikkhus it must be, there is no materiality, there's no form, whatever, no feeling, whatever, no perception, whatever, no mental activity, whatever, no consciousness, whatever, that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, that will last as long as eternity. So this is all about time. You know, he's talking about things being transient, moving on. So this is, a, this is very important to, to see what, the, what the, the words that he's using, like uh, that uh, are, uh, these are antonyms, that the opposite of what uh, um, uh, impermanence, opposite of, of things, uh, you know, uh, so this is, 
This is what the Buddha is talking about. He's giving, talking about time, so this is very important. And the Buddha taught uh, Anicca at every level, actually, every level of existence. So he, often, he taught it at a momentary level, but he also taught it at the level, momentary in the sense of momentary experience, and I'll, sh I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And he taught it at the level, we can see it, birth, old age, sickness and death. That's Anicca, that's transience, that's uh, um, impermanence. And he also taught it at the cosmic sort of level, you know, the universal level, because he said, and it's interesting, I don't know how you feel when you hear this, but he, he says that in a, a sutta called the Seven Sun, Seven Sun Sutra, sutra that the earth will be burnt up by the seventh sun, it will be destroyed. So this whole world, all this history that we have, you know, all this, all this human activity we have, you know, all the, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, all the great civilization, civilizations in India, uh, the, you know, the Hinduism, Buddhism, all this, everything gone. And it's amazing, isn't it, when you think like that. So he's looking at it from the momentary right through to the cosmic. You're looking at hundreds of thousands of years, so it's incredible. I often, I did wonder, though I think some people say no, whether these seven suns are like nuclear, <laughs> nuclear devices, because I thought, well, it could be like a sun. So, and another, um, another way he, the momentary, the way he explained the momentary experience of Nietzsche is, he says here, because there are three characteristics of the form, those things that come together like this cup, arising is evident. And fall is evident, you know, that will break, fall away. And the alteration of what is present uh, is evident. So it's changing all the time. And then uh, this gives a very concrete example of, of uh, rising and passing away from the Buddha's own experience. In the, there's a sutta uh, called the Wonderful and Marvelous Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. And in that sutta, Benwa Ananda, who is the, uh, the Buddha's um, assistant, personal assistant, um, was describing the Buddha's uh, wonderful and marvelous qualities. And they're all like very supernatural, uh, you know, extraordinary uh, supernatural type uh, experiences. Like that the Buddha, the, he was a bodhisattva then, when he was born from, uh, descended from the Tusita heaven to his mother's womb, he was fully conscious. He was aware of what was happening. When he was born, he was fully aware of what was happening. And when he was born, they say he took seven steps and said he was the supreme, he was the highest, he was the oldest, and this would be his last life. It's interesting he said that, isn't it? <laughs> he was just born. Um, but then, these are all, and, the, and, the, and uh, Ananda says, I've heard this from the Tathagata, from the Buddha. And the Buddha says, yes, this is so, Ananda. But then he says to Ananda, that being so, Ananda, remember this too as a wonderful and marvellous quality of the Tathagata. This is the Buddha. Here, Ananda, the Tathagata's feelings are known as they arise, as they are present, as they disappear. Perceptions are known as they arise, as they are present, as they disappear. Thoughts are known as they arise, as they are present, as they disappear. Remember this too, Ananda, as a wonderful and marvellous quality of the Tathagata. I mean, we, many people might think, wow, so what? <laughs> but actually, are, we, are you aware, am I aware of every feeling that's arising, every uh, perception that's arising, every thought that's arising, moment by moment? By moment? No. This is fantastic, this is extraordinary, you know, because you need enormous sati, mindfulness, you need enormous samadhi, that stillness of mind, that focus, one-pointedness, to see that, that's incredible. And then you might well think, well, so what? So what? But actually, you know, uh, what drives human beings, isn't it, is feeling. We're all after, if everybody is driven by this wanting, pleasant feeling, and we run away as much as possible from unpleasant feeling. And so we, we are always in this constant chase after things that are pleasant, running away from things that are unpleasant, and ignoring things that are neither pleasant or unpleasant. But if we see the beginning, the persistence, and the end of a, a feeling, be it pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling, 
it doesn't have the power over us anymore. Because most of the time, we are very afraid of unpleasant feeling. We run away. So if we get an ache in the body, we'll change postures. If we feel uh, unpleasant feeling in the mind, you know, there's a, we feel a bit depressed or down, we'll go and ring somebody or, or order a pizza or we'll watch something on TV. We're not, we're not going to see the, 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 that feeling end. When we see something arise, persist and then pass away, it can no longer have power over us. And this is the same for pleasant feeling too, because we're hooked on pleasant feeling. We only want pleasant feeling. And so we, we actually swing between the two of them like a pendulum, you know, trying to grab the, the pleasant, get rid of the unpleasant. And this is, gives us no freedom at all. And this is when somebody like the Buddha is talking about seeing the arising and the passing away of feeling, perceptions and thought. They have no power over somebody who's seen them in their totality. They know what they are. They know they're transient, they're Nietzsche, they're not self, and that they are dukkha as well. Not going to be involved. So this is a very, the very um, important um, teaching of uh, arising and passing away. Good example. And so I'll finish off in a minute, actually, I think. So I was going to give an example of birth, old age, sickness and death. You know, the, there's quite a few. The Buddha talked about them a lot. And in fact, the reason he left the palace was to find the solution, find the answer to old age, sickness and death. This was his main motivation. But I was just, I'll just mention in brief, because uh, though it's a lovely story, is uh, Venerable Patachara. You've probably heard of her. She, were, she was a bhikkhuni, but um, she had the uh, really incredible experience of in one day, they say, of seeing her two children die, her husband die, all very tragic circumstances, and her parents and brother die. And she lost the plot, and uh, she went completely uh, crazy, went crazy, wandering around the city where the Buddha lives, Salvati, half naked. People are trying to get rid of her, <laughs> here, there and everywhere. And she came into where the Buddha was. And uh, the, instead of uh, shooing her away, the Buddha actually beckoned her to come. And then, you know, he, he spoke to her. And he, I think more than speaking to her, he must have given her this real blast of loving kindness. Because when somebody's in that state, words are not what they need. They need reassurance. They need uh, acceptance. Someone that's going to give them this warmth, this kindness, you know, that they know they're not being judged and so on. And then he taught her about death, the inevitability of death. And after that, not only did she regain her sanity, she became a sotapanna. So she saw that everything is of the nature to arise and of the nature to cease. So she saw that. And when she became an arahant, that was her experience too, because she was washing her feet one, one evening and she saw the water from washing her feet, run a little distance, sink into the ground, and then she put a bit more on, and it went a bit further and sunk into the ground. And she put a bit more on, and it went further and then sunk into the ground. And she realized some people die, pass away, when they're very young, like her babies, actually, they're only very young. Some people pass away in middle age, like her husband, and some people pass away in old age, like her mother, father, and mother and father. And so she had a breakthrough then to enlightenment. Her mind came together, it focused. She said it was like a, in the verses, the verses of the uh, enlightened nuns, and uh, there's also the verses of the enlightened monks. In those verses, she said it was like a, uh, a well-trained thoroughbred horse. So the mind would do, any, would do exactly what she wanted. So focusing on this experience and seeing the meaning in that experience of Anicca, that everything that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. Then she went into the hut and she got her needle, they say a needle in the verse, and then pulled the wick down, the light went out. And she said that was her experience of Nibbana was like that. You know, she had finished with all the dukkha, with all the uh, unsatisfactoriness in life. She had become enlightened. She'd seen Nibbana, she'd seen the Four Noble Truths, and she was completely enlightened. And she became the senior nun in Vinaya, actually, in Vin Vinaya, actually. So her, her experience shows us, you know, the power of contemplating old age, sickness and death. So I say to people, and I'm getting old, 
I say, this is our kamatana, this is our meditation object, is our experience of old age sickness and death. You know, this is something that we can use for, for developing wisdom. We don't have to identify with it and become total, uh, suffer a lot. So this is the, the wisdom of um, Anicca. I'll just uh, finish off with a, a last story. It's nice to have a last story. And this is a story that uh, it, it, it points to the fact too that sometimes, of course, when things are impermanent, that can be quite, quite good. If you're sick and it's impermanent, that's very nice. <laughs> it's past and so on. So this is one of the uh, criticisms people often have, they say, with the word impermanent. Impermanent, uh, that um, not everything that is impermanent is dukkha, that's what they will say. But certainly everything that's uncertain is dukkha. So things that are unstable, that are transient, they are dukkha. But in this story, um, this is a story from Ajahn Jayasaro, a monk, an English monk who lives in Thailand and is a very, very nice Dhamma speaker and extraordinarily wise person, always has been. And uh, he, as a young man, he was only 19, he had this burning desire, which I, I wonder where it came from, to be a sadhu, Hindu sadhu in India and to go and live in a cave. He did. <laughs> he did do this. And in those days, he took a bus across, um, you know, a lot of the Middle East, and he was travelling, you know, days and days, and desert everywhere, rocks and, you know, some hills, and very hot. And then one night, when he was on the bus, they had this storm, and the storm was really heavy and a lot of rain, and he couldn't believe it. In the morning, he opened his eyes, and the light came up, Flowers everywhere. He said, beautiful coloured flowers, turquoise, reds, you know, all colours, all around, like an ocean of flowers. And he said, it's just extraordinary that this landscape, one moment, this totally barren, you know, uh, inhospitable uh, environment, and then this beautiful landscape. And he said it's like that for us too, when we're going through the, the barren landscape, the deserts of our experience, you know, when things are bad, and things are not going the way we wish, then we can just wait for the rain, however that comes, when you might hear from a friend, or there may be something that brings the rain to, to our minds, to our experience, and then the flowers come. So this is, this is also the wisdom of a Nietzsche too, that things will change sometimes for the better, and that, that can give us hope in the times when our minds, when we, because I know for most people, myself included, when you have dark moods, you feel like it's going to last forever. <laughs> but this is the wisdom of this too will pass. This is another way of expressing it. So it's very, uh, very useful. And uh, also one of the teachings, one of the, just to finish off, one of the important things to know uh, that brings some sort of certainty to our lives, some sort of st stability, is the knowledge that impermanence is permanent. <laughs> Uncertainty is certain. When we know that, there's much less problems. We're not going to fight with reality. We won't complain when things are impermanent, when they change, when they're transient, when they're uncertain. We just, yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> But when we know it deeply, then the mind will be free and then we'll be on the path to enlightenment. So I encourage each and every one of you to develop your understanding of the Nietzsche, to explore it, to investigate it. Not to believe me, to, to investigate the Buddha's words. So thank you very much for listening. And so on.